we do developer stuff for Cisco. Um, come talk to us tomorrow in our suite if you have questions about any of that. Okay, so this talk, Marie Curie, open source, Kickstarter, women in tech, started with a present from my dad. So this is um, a book that he gave me for my birthday. It was about Marie Curie, who was one of my childhood heroes. And so he gave me this book for my birthday, and what I expected was, you know, a nice read uh, that it would kind of tickle my fancy in intellectual property law because one of the facets of Marie Curie's story that the author dives into in this is some of the, the intellectual property law around her work. And then it would maybe have some interesting facts about my third grade hero. But what I actually found when I read the book was that there were all these interesting parallels between the Curie's treatment of their work in the early 1900s and today's tech industry. So first, before we dive into those parallels, I want to do a quick refresher on Marie Curie, uh, because maybe she wasn't your third grade hero. She's probably a name you saw in a textbook somewhere along the way. I don't want to remind everyone what she did. So my, um, my original first early career in school was chemical engineering. So I also have some ties to this from that uh, previous career before I made my way to technology and software. Okay, so this is a great quote from Marie Curie, and I have a couple of these throughout. Uh, so she says, life is not easy for any of us, but what of that? We must have perseverance and above all confidence in ourselves, and we must believe that we are gifted for something and that this thing must be attained. And I think this is a quote that kind of resonates throughout her work that we'll look at. So what did she do? She coined the term radioactive. She was part of the most famous husband and wife team in science probably ever, probably still to this day. Uh, she discovered two new elements, radium and polonium. She was the first female professor at the Sorbonne, the first woman to be awarded the Nobel Prize ever, and still the only woman to win it in two different fields, because she actually won it in chemistry and in physics. Um, so a lot of really interesting you know, accomplishments to her name. But what really stood out to me when I was reading about her and learning about her as a kid was this is the periodic table of the elements, what they knew in 1898, before her work. And the places where those two green arrows are pointing, those are places that they, they hypothesized that elements needed to exist. They thought there were elements that had those atomic numbers that would exist there, but no one could prove it. And this is the periodic chart we're used to today. And the two in green are the two elements that she discovered. And I think that was such a tangible, um, thing to understand as a kid, that literally these, these elements, people couldn't prove the existence before her work, and then afterward, they could. So it was this very interesting thing to point to that was really inspiring for me. And then as we get into her work, I want to overlay it on her life. So she has a, a quote that says, I've frequently been questioned, especially by women, of how I could reconcile family life with a scientific career. Well, it has not been easy. And that's probably um, a huge understatement that kind of underlies a, a lot of the writings about her work. And so this is a timeline of kind of her life and her work. And I think when I studied about her in school and was getting excited about chemistry and things like that, I only saw the professional piece of this timeline, the when she started the study, when she won a Nobel Prize award. And then as you overlay sort of the life pieces to it of when she gets married, when she has her first kid, um, you know, the fact that she earned the Nobel Prize the same year that she earned her doctorate is pretty amazing. And the fact that that was just a few years after having her first child. Um, it becomes really interesting how fast some of this happened in terms of, of her life and how it overlays. So keep this in mind as we dive into some of these, these parallels. Okay, so first, the first parallel is some work around what they did with radium versus open source. Um, and it essentially is sort of around a publish versus patent dilemma, which is something that we see with, you know, private, uh, privately owned code versus open source, and also in terms of scientific achievement. So they discovered radium. And hang with me through this chemistry part for just a minute. It's important, and it gets us to the next part pretty quickly. So they became interested in radiation. From the studies that they did, they found a way to very precisely measure radiation in a way that no one had ever been able to measure it before. 
And from that, they could hypothesize that this particular um, ore that they were studying, called pitchblende, contained a highly radioactive element that was as yet unknown. And that's what started them down this path of discovering polonium and radium. So they knew that these elements had to exist. They knew it existed in this ore. But they had to isolate radium to prove its existence. No one was going to actually put it on that chart and say, this is a new element someone has discovered unless they could isolate a piece of it. So they had to develop the actual process for isolating it. It doesn't occur freely in nature by itself. And so this process for refining and the, um, the pitch blend and isolating the, the radium where they could prove its existence, this was actually like secret sauce. This was something no one knew how to do. Anyone could get the pitch blend, anyone could experiment with it, you could have the theory, but no one else knew how to actually refine it. So they had this question of publish or patent. The discovery of a new element. That's pure science, right? That's not something that you're going to patent. That goes back to the scientific community. But this process to refine new elements, this was something that a lot of people were patenting. And there was huge commercial value to it. Because at this time, there were all these theories about how radioactive elements were going to do all these amazing things in medicine, which they have to some degree, um, you know, starting to work with x-rays, all of these industrial applications. So there was a huge financial incentive and upside for them if they could indeed patent this actual invention around the process. But there was a tricky part to this. In the early 1900s in France, married women didn't have the right to own property. And this extended to intellectual property. So um, the actual law put married women with the same status as children and the insane. Couldn't sign contracts, couldn't own property, couldn't do any of that. So you certainly couldn't leave, you could not apply for a patent on something if you were a married woman at that time in France. So, publish your patent. Who's been through a patent process? Anyone? Yeah. Can you imagine doing it with like your lead researcher and telling him you can't be on this patent? It's like kind of mind blowing, right? And she she was actually the main researcher on the isolation process of radium. So, what did they do? They had to um, they really had to think through this and I think what they came up with has a lot of resonance with the way we handle some things in the modern world. So it was kind of like, voila, open source. They published the knowledge and the details of the refining process in scientific journals and letters. And then they patented the tools and the measuring devices that actually help you do the process. And then they sold consulting services to help you do it. So this to me started to sound really familiar, like an open source project that maybe offers a hosted enterprise subscription and special tools to go with it, and then a thriving community forms around it as well. And so this was one of these first parallels that showed up to me that I just thought was really um, interesting in how they went about hand handling this. The other part of this is that the, um, the way that they did the contributions to the research was, was very interesting. Marie Curie was a maniacal like, notebook taker. And she um, made her notebooks very, very public. It was almost like doing commits to an open source project. And this really helped establish her as being a real contributor to the project, even though she was a woman at that time when there weren't a lot of women doing that research. And so she relentlessly built this public persona through a track record of work that was very concrete, very provable, very showable. Um, and this, I think, is, is something that people can do today, right? You can build your track record through participating in open source. The notebooks are really interesting. There's a process to digitize them right now, her actual original notebooks, uh, because they are still so radioactive, they have to be stored in a lead cabinet. Um, so they're like locked away and they're trying to digitize them and make them available on the internet, which is, is pretty cool that you could go back and see all of her original notes. Um, so as she was going through doing this process of getting to this point of deciding what to do with this, this discovery, there was an interesting um, process that happened. At that time in France, the Academy of Sciences was sort of the reigning body of 
you know, anything important happening in the sciences had to be recognized by this body. And so researchers would send notes to be presented before the academy, and they would read them, and this is how they get to the point of having their, their discovery recognized. And in the process of that um, it publication process that she went through, there were three notes that they sent. And it was really interesting. The first one she sent with herself as the single author, and she used her full name with her Polish middle name. The second note, which started to become tending towards the more commercial process, tending towards the bigger discovery, she follows her husband, so it's Madame S. Curie. And then on the final note, she's sandwiched between two men and Madame P. Curie, and her name's not even really there anymore. She's just her, she's just Madame Pierre Curie's wife. Um, and so throughout this whole process, you can see that Pierre's identity remained really stable and hers is a little bit fluid. And as they got closer to the discovery being more meaningful, it was because they had to assign the work to someone who had that personhood, that ability to sign contracts under the law. And so you kind of start to see how societal laws and thinking began to impact the work that was going on in the scientific community and, and how that was handled. Okay, so then after that, they, 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 they get to the point where they do that publication. They jointly win um, a Nobel Prize for discovering radium. And then things get really interesting. So in 1904, Marie Curie and Pierre Curie were, s they were total celebrities. They were like Elon Musk of that time or something, right? They were these like technological, amazing scientists. They were on the cover of Vanity Fair. They were, the, the imagination of the world was kind of taken with them. Pierre has the glowing, you know, radium, radioactive gl uh, radium in that, in that picture. And that was in 1904. And then in 1906, tragedy strikes, and Pierre is actually hit by a carriage and killed. And so this really changed things about how the work was progressing and, and opened up a lot of questions. So everything's kind of disrupted. Um, at this time, France felt that the radioactive research was really important to the economic and security and military future of France, and they didn't want to fall behind in it. So they nominated Marie to succeed Pierre at the Sorbonne and be the first female professor, because they didn't want the, to lose that research. So this was a huge milestone and, and, and really, really great. Um, except now things are different because she's a widow, and so now she can own property and is actually a considered a person under the law. So things start to change at this point. It's kind of this coming out of the shadows. The work on radioactivity is continuing. Pierre can't be the lead on the articles. Marie can sign contracts and own property, be a professor and manage the lab. And she becomes hard to ignore in this case. And this becomes slightly irritating to some of the established uh, you know, French uh, science um, community <laughs> at this point. And so, and it was at a time in France where there was a rising tide of French traditionalism, and she was seen as representing modern. She was seen as being you know, a, a young mother. She had recently gotten her PhD and was the first professor at the Sorbonne, and there was a, a division in the press around traditionalism and Marie Curie representing someone very, very modern, which had a lot of controversy around it. And then at the same time, um, right after it, a seat on this very prestigious Academy of Sciences opens up, and these don't open up very often. Uh, Pierre had won a seat in 1905. Um, they elected someone else to take his place, and then another seat opened in 1910. And Marie was nominated as a candidate, which was huge in of itself. And the, the book says she seemed like a shoe-in, which I thought, I've never seen the word shoe-in written down before, so I wanted to put it on my slide, because it looks pretty funny written down, right? Um, so it was like, she seems like a natural choice. Like, of course, she's our celebrity. She's representing this. She's going to be um, elected. But she was the first female candidate ever. And so this opened up a lot of that controversy between the traditional and the modern and how this was approached in French society. And she knew this was going to be the case. There's this quote from her saying that she does not want the election to be discussed in the media. It's not usually discussed in the media. It's just within the scientific community. She doesn't want this to change for her. 
but that did not work. Um, this is actually Marie Curie hiding behind her purse from, from the paparazzi uh, because they started following her everywhere, trying to get interviews, writing all these articles, and it just became a really big media affair that I don't think we think about happening in the, in the early 1900s like that. Like, I had never really thought about that being the case. And so then it becomes this choice between two worlds, and the press, you know, shows it like that, where there's um, Edward Branley, he's, this is his third time to be a candidate, so it's his third try to be on the Academy, but Curie is seen as being modern and the academics who want modernism, but Branley is seen as being the safe choice. And so they, they really pitched it in this particular way that didn't actually have a lot to do with the science behind it. I mean, I think they were both very, very qualified, but the debate became more about who they were instead of the science that the people had done. And so what happens? She was not elected. Branley was elected. And everyone thought, will she try again? And she decided not to try again. She decided it was, you know, it wasn't really worth the controversy. She actually wanted to get back to her lab and focus on the science. But how long do you think it was until the first mem female member of the academy was elected? Guesses? 26 years? Anyone else? 60? 68. 68 years. Um, yeah, it's pretty amazing. 1979, I'm like, that's after I was born. That's kind of, kind of a weird statistic to, to think about. <coughs> okay, so that controversy ended. She wasn't elected. But then things like, went to the next level of weird uh, because there had been so, so much media fervor about it. She had some love, love letters stolen. There was an alleged affair. There were five duels fought over her honor. And this is actual footage of one of the duels happening that you can find on YouTube. Uh, that was like actual, some of them were pistol duels and some of them were s actual sword duels. Um, and during the midst of all of this, she wins the second Nobel Prize, which is her by herself on, on, on the second Nobel Prize in, phys in chemistry. And um, there was a lot of controversy. They actually asked her maybe not to come to the banquet for the Nobel Prize, but she went anyway. Um, and so it was just really, it, it's, it, this is one of those overlays of the life plus, sci plus scientific work that's really interesting. Okay, so that's kind of all of that piece of it. And now I want to talk about what I call Marie Curie's Kickstarter campaign. And this is about sort of crowdsourcing radium. So this is radium. How much do you think one gram of radium cost in 1920? Or in the $10? $10. Anybody else? $50 in that time, that time's dollars. In like 1921, I think is the year we're going for. In that dollars, $50, anyone? $100,000 for one gram of radium. It was the most valuable material on earth at that time. So you can see why that process to refine it w would have been extremely lucrative, right? Why that was such a big decision. And so, at this same time, uh, Marie Curie met this New York socialite who was very taken with the idea of Marie Curie and wanted to get to know her and wanted to write about her and, and sort of introduce her to America a little bit more. And she was having a conversation with her and she said, well, you know, you must have like ton, you know, loads of, of radium for you to do your own personal research on. You're the discoverer of radium, right? Doesn't your lab have like lots of radium to do research on? And Marie Curie said, I don't have any, I have zero. She's like, M the university has a small amount, but we can't really afford it because it's so expensive. And my actual research group doesn't have any. And this New York socialite decided she wanted to address that problem. And so she started a subscription fund to buy Marie Curie a gram of radium. So, and this was gonna be a personal gift to Marie for her own research, for her lab to do this. And when she started it, she thought that she was just going to go get maybe like 10 of her wealthy friends to donate $10,000, be done with it, buy the gram, and, and go on with it. But what actually ended up happening was they opened it up, and they said you can go into all these different banks, and anyone can donate any amount of money. So they had some people donating bigger amounts, but they had a lot of people going in and donating $1 or $2. And people were literally having bake sales 
to <laughs> help raise money to buy Marie Curie a gram of radium. And this was really powerful. It captured everyone's imagination. People really got behind it. And they ended up raising three times the amount that Einstein won in the Nobel Prize that year. So today, that would be like $3 million, like, um, which is pretty, pretty insane if you did the equivalent math. Um, and this was enough to buy a couple grams of radium and have some, or and have some given to her institute for research as well. So those are all interesting facts and parallels, but kind of like why talk about all this history? It's interesting, but why, why do we want to talk about it and think about it? And it kind of comes down to me that sometimes when we're watching things blow up in the media or maybe controversies that you even see in your workplace or in a personal level and, and you see things, sometimes if you kind of take the current event and switch out names to someone that might be more famous or, or someone from the past, it gives you a different perspective on it, right? Like I think if you if we switch out some names and we think Marie Curie is being stopped from doing this because of such and such, it sounds quite absurd. And so it can give you some of that interesting context about what's going on today and how we treat things today. And then the other reason is kind of back to the idea that she was my third grade hero and sort of the power of heroes and, and what that does. And um, I assume everyone or a lot of people saw the Wonder Woman movie, yeah? Pretty good, you like it? Yeah, so um, I went to go see it. I took my uh, five-year-old niece with me and, um, and I was watching it and I was like, man, I was, it really hit me much more powerfully than I thought it was. I was really busy that summer and I was like, yeah, I wanna go see it, but I didn't think too much about it. I went to go see it and I was like, wow, this is amazing. And that could have been because my niece was sitting beside me the whole time going, I cannot believe this like over and over and over again as she watched it. Um, but then I told my husband about this and he said, well, yeah, he's like, of course, I'm not surprised that you were really into that movie because of your name tag. And I said, my name tag, what? And he's like, yeah, your name tag. And um, so this is a name tag that I made when I was a little kid. I grew up in a small Texas town and I thought those label makers were like really fun toy. You know, the ones where you turn the label and yeah. So some of us are old enough to remember this. Um, so I made this name tag, and it says Wonder Woman, Mandy White, Queen of Hawaii. And it's in this little box because my mom sent it to me after I had had my first kid, and I was trying to struggle through going back to work. And I couldn't really wrap my head around being a mom, having my job, like how do I fit all these things together? And she sent this to me and said, look at all the things you thought you could be when you were five at the same time. I'm pretty sure you can figure this out. And so I was like, okay, that's, that's, that's pretty good. But back to the power of heroes, when I look back at that younger self who was reading about Marie Curie and then later just picking a major, like when you're in early high school picking a major and you don't know anything about any of these majors or what you really want to be, you know, I think everyone's reasons for picking are a little bit um, opaque to ourselves, right? So I think back and I think math, I loved math, I was really into math. And when I thought of math, I thought of Alan Turing and Nash. And then I thought, oh, I, I maybe I want to be an archaeologist. Like, I loved archaeology, and, um, you know, Indiana Jones was cool when I was little, Jack Horner when I was bigger. Marie Curie kind of represented chemistry to me. My grandmother was in the Navy, so she told me about Grace Hopper, like, all the time. And then, um, so that was kind of represented computers, along with Clifford Stoll, uh, the author of The Cuckoo's Egg. Anybody read that book? This is an amazing book. It's old, it's like from the 70s, but it's like amazing. It's like one of the first hacking exploits kind of mystery story, but real life, it's, it's pretty amazing. So when I was picking a major, I picked chemistry and computers and did both of those, chemical engineering and computer engineering. And I don't know, I don't know if that really factored into it that I actually had some women role models for that. But when I look back at what I said in high school was that those seemed more realistic to me. Um, and so, you know, I don't know, it's hard to untangle that, but I do think it is, it is important to consider. So, this is the book, it's called Making Marie Intellectual Property and Celebrity Culture in an Age of Information. It's a great book, I definitely recommend it if any of these things were kind of interesting to you. And I um, would love to chat with you afterwards if this gets you thinking about anything or, you know, if, if anything was interesting about it. So, thanks so much, have a good afternoon.